beside you Look for me I try to forget In your conversations with Shauna Hagen uh, for the book, you talk about the album Ghostine as and an imagined world where Arthur, your son, could be. Um, was it your desire to create that album for him or actually for you as a family? You never have any concrete reason why you make a record. You go in and pull tiny threads together and, and hopefully come up with something. You don't have a, a grand plan um, ex because the whole thing is so difficult and so tenuous the process of making a record. I think they're singing to be free. I think they're singing to be free. There was something that was going on with that particular record that was different than other records. And there became a kind of a, a parallel mission to me within the state of mind that I was, where I felt that it was a place that Arthur could inhabit on some level. Look for me. If I could move the night I would And I would turn the world round if I could There's nothing wrong with loving something You can't hold in your head The music is so beautiful. There is nowhere for you to hide. You really, you know, you're so front and centre. And it's very revealing and exposing in a way to be that person that's out there in front of the music when you're singing about things that are so painful. Yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of pain in ghosting, but there's a lot of, um, it, it, I think most of the songs just have this lovely upward lift. Uh, the, the trajectory of the songs is, they all seem to just move upward like that. And so th there was a lot I got from that in, in a very positive way. There's, there's a, a, a weird joyfulness about ghosting that's often overlooked. Well, the moon won't get a wink of sleep If I stay all night and talk If I stay all night and talk In the conversations, you talk about a very definite difference between being spiritual and being religious? You know, I, I think religion asks something of us. It asks something of us. And spirituality is a little bit more amorphous and we can all be spiritual and we are all spiritual and like, well, of course we are all spiritual. Um, but religion requires, it's spir spiritu spirituality with rigor, let's say, it requires something of us. And that action, um, I think, is what it's probably all about. So what does being religious require of you? For me, I'm more um, inclined to do religious things like go to church, uh, pray, um, read scripture. I mean, I've always done these things anyway. Um, actually, even in, at, in my most chaotic times, I've done those sorts of things. But I feel uh, that, that when I walk, w when I read scripture or when I walk out of church, or I, I feel less, I, I feel my skepticism is a little less. And I, it's I more distant. Little, it's a little more you distant. put it at bay. Yeah. And is there a... But that struggle, the yeah. struggle is very much where I am and, and, and in regard to religion and the ideas of God and, and Christian ideas. It's, it's, a, it's a struggle. I'm by no means arrived anywhere on that kind of thing. Do you think that Arthur's death strengthened your faith? Yeah, I, I think a lot of things happened. I think the writing of the book, weirdly enough, did that. Um, the book itself starts uh, with, with a, a kind of nervousness around questions of faith and ends, ends more 
firm about those sorts of things. Now that's, when I talk about, when we're talking about faith here, I'm also talking about doubt. You know, these two things for me uh, go hand in hand and, and you know, a, a, a deep ingrained skepticism I have towards these sorts of things. And the faith that I feel is that occasional uh, journeying away from that skepticism into something else. Um, and I, I find that really a powerful um, place to be, especially uh, imaginatively and creatively. In the book, um, you say that religion can be um, a shepherding force that holds communities together. There is an argument to say that religion is not always a force for good. That's very true. And it's, there's many arguments why religion is, is not a force for good. But when I walk into a, a, a Christian church, I walk into something that I feel I belong to. It's my thing. It's something that um, I was raised in as a child. There's a sense of nostalgia, a sense of safety about that. I, I don't step into that and deny anyone else their religious beliefs or whatever. It just feels like it's my place. Um, and I don't say that in any um, divisive or like nationalistic way or, or anything like that. I mean, I just never connected to Eastern religion, let's say, you know, that, that was too, too spiritual in a sense. So I, I never found the language, the aesthetic, anything about it particularly compelling for me personally. Um, and I, I always found something in the figure of Christ that was deeply compelling to me. Um, it always was, even as a child. I don't believe in an interventionist God. But I know, darling, that you do. a song into my arms I don't believe in an interventionist God and you have also as you say changed your idea about faith and doubt I mean, I mean that particular song if you, you know that particular song to me feels like a person on the point of conversion I think that's what that song saying well not to touch a hair in your head leave you as you are he felt he had to direct you and direct you into my own. But it's a, it's a good serviceable song because it, it you know, well, it, it services the atheist and the believer and, and pretty much everyone can kind of play that at a wedding or a funeral or whatever. It's, it's done me very well, that song, because <laughs> it's kind of a broad church, shall we say, and, a lot, and everyone can collect within that song. But for, for me, it's essentially a religious song. And, and it's that I don't believe in God, it's that I don't believe in an interventionist God. Into my arms, O oh Lord, into my arms. The Red Hand Files, um, which seem like a kind of act of generosity, and I wonder if they came directly out of your son Arthur's death. No, they, they well, they, in the sense that I didn't know how to speak about Arthur, um, I was getting a lot of uh, people writing to me um, in response to Arthur's death, um, telling me their stories, not so much in sympathy, rather than like, this is what happened to me, this is what might happen to you. And uh, that was, um, the, the, I saw those as these kind of momentary flashes of light that I grabbed hold of it and felt um, I felt helped by it, those responses. And so some, I think a, a couple of years later, I just started up the Red Hand Files in a more general kind of way. Ask me anything. I'm a musician. Ask me anything. But the, the questions very quickly became about other things. Um, and the, the, it, wasn't, it, it, was a, it was both me and the audience pushing... Um, pushing the conversation outwards. It seemed like it was, it was a, a salve for you and a salve for the people that were it writing was. the letters. Yeah, 
when, when you say it was an act of generosity, I, I think that works the other way too. I feel that when people write in to the Red Hand Files and spend a lot of care and attention around what they write to me, they are acts of generosity as well. And I mean, you get thousands of you know, requests. It's a difficult decision, isn't it? Because you can't answer them all. You can't answer, them. yeah, no, I have to balance them and um, look at, you know, I mean, they, sometimes the, 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 there's several in a row that are a, a kind of grim and I try and lighten the mood with another one and so forth. So I, I try, it, it, it is a little bit of a balancing act. And, and I wonder in that sense if there's anything that's off limits that you would have to answer. Yeah, there's a lot of things I won't answer, mostly because I don't think those questions have necessarily come in good faith, I would say. Um, and so I, I don't, th there's, there's too much in there of, uh, of value to, to write about. I wonder if the Red Hand Files were a form of ministry? Well, I wouldn't, that seems a little highfalutin. <laughs> you know, I never saw it in that way. Um, I, I think the, the Red Hand Files for me was uh, a way to learn how to articulate certain things that were going on me with the help of the people who wrote in. So it felt like something we were doing together. And that, um, that's that been enormously helpful. And I think it's been helpful to other people too. Um, and that's how to write about something. It's actually quite difficult, uh, quite different than how to speak about something. And I think with, with Sean's book that we wrote together, I learned how to, through these conversations, how to speak about these matters as well. Issue number 210. I'm 62 years old and decided to learn how to play guitar. Rock guitar. Is such an endeavor a fool's errand for someone of my age? Dear Chris, yes, it is almost certainly a fool's errand to learn the guitar at 62. However, personally, I have a lot of time for fool's errands. About two years ago, at the age of 63, I decided I would become a ceramicist. It was by any measure a fool's errand. I had made some ceramic pieces when I was a teenager, and they were not bad, but there was nothing to suggest that I had any particular talent with clay. Still, my mother liked them, so I thought it might be fun to make some more. Get your act together, and if you do, and Warren, Marty, Jim and I ever get around to making a new Grinder Man record, you can come and play on it. Grinder Man, as a matter of policy, only work with the very old, the out of shape, and the extremely foolish. We are the obscene and joyous embodiment of a fool's errand, and we are waiting. There is no time to waste. Love, Nick. That's particular act of generosity. Well, he, he can come and play with us. I mean, anyone can come and play with Grinder Man, this, my, my other Grindr group, Man. but you have to be old, and, and you have to be... Um, <laughs> Irrelevant. <laughs> I, I, another question, though, which again, Eric Mann wrote to you and talked about a musician that had passed away and the fact that a Supreme Court justice in America, who he really despised, loved this musician, and and he was very annoyed about that, and he and he was appalled that um, that this musician was liked by this judge because it kind of negated he thought I think what he thought of the musician. Um, do you believe that your music is for everyone? I mean, would you ever say, no, I, I really, I don't want that audience? I mean, look, I, I get a lot of pushback from what I write, and I got an enormous amount of pushback with that particular question because it, it, it opens with, I've, you know, I've cast my mind around and I can't come up with a single person that I wouldn't want to listen to my music. And that got, or, or that didn't deserve on some level to listen to, to my music. Um, and I got a lot of rage back about that and people saying, what about this person and what about that person? But the point I was really trying to make in that particular letter is that music is fundamentally a good thing and it makes people better in my view. So, um, so even, even if there is someone that you might consider deplorable or despicable, uh, I think that they, that, that that they might be listening to my music feels that they may be a little bit better by the end of the record. I don't know.
that's that's what I was trying to put forward. I, I guess it's more that I, that I don't want my music ever to be used as a form of punishment or that I deny my music to, to certain people um, because of where they stand politically. I mean, where do you even begin with something like that? You know, where, where, do, where's the, where do you draw the line anyway? Well, I mean, I suppose the, the whole thing about separating art from the artist as well is another, the flip side of looking at that. And so, you know, I suppose the most recent one of that would be you know, Kanye, uh, you know, is an, accused of anti-Semitism. So therefore, you know, should you be listening to his music or should he actually be, be shunned? I mean, are you completely open on that? Well, on some level, I, I don't care what Kanye has to say on things, but I, I, uh, but I do love Kanye's music. Um, I, I find anti-Semitism in particular, particularly distasteful. And so it's very disappointing to, to hear these remarks and, and, and such sort of obvious, um, boring kind of reductive tropes that he's actually peddling to be incredibly disappointing. However, it just, it's a personal choice as to whether you can go on and listen to that person's music. I personally can. I love Kanye's music. I, I feel that he's done the best music of anybody. In, a, in, in some time, the most interesting, challenging, bold music. And, and maybe, I mean, this is a complex argument, but maybe there's something to do with a transgressive personality that, that ma makes a person willing to take certain kind of risks with their music, because Kanye does that, and it's, it's exciting. That, that aspect of what he does is exciting. But I, in no way, you know, I, what he was saying is obviously uh, disappointing, you know. Cindy is my honey, the sweetest in the south. Uh, when we kiss, the bees would all swarm around our mouth. Well, get on home, Cindy, Cindy, get on home. Well, get on home, Cindy, Cindy, I'll marry you someday. Yes, I will. As you get older, are you more self-reflective, do you think? Yeah, well, of course. You wouldn't want to be the other way. <laughs> Some people are. <laughs> but do you think you as a kind of, do you think you are more open to people? More? I, I, I just think, I don't know if I say this in the book, but I think after my son died, I personally think I became an actual person. And that before that happened, I was uh, incomplete or unformed human being. I, I had a very narrow view of the world, um, a much more strident view of the world. Travel this world around for an answer that refused to be found. Well, I don't know why and I don't know how, but she's nobody's baby now. There, there, there seemed to be some correlation between my stridency about things and my lack of understanding about things. In fact, the less I knew, the more opinionated and certain I would become. And there's something that happened when my son died that smashed all that to bits and I could see the world in a much more uh, nuanced way, I think, um, and a much more empathetic way. Because in a way, gr grief just becomes part of who we are. Yeah, I, th yeah. I, I think so. I think that that's our common bond, is uh, that we all uh, have, a, 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 particularly as we grow older, uh, we are all kind of creatures of loss or, yeah. or grief. You said in Faith, Hope and Carnage, we are each of us imperiled insofar as anything can turn catastrophic at any time. You know, do you think that's true, that we're never really equipped to deal with that dreadful loss and shock? Um, uh, you, you know, it seems to me that grief is not just one thing. It's not just how you feel about the loss of one thing. It's a kind of, uh, 
I find all the griefs tend to kind of collect around the new thing. I mean, uh, that sounds terrible, the way that that came out, but I think we get better at it or, or we get more used to the state of that state of being. You know, I remember my mother who, who died. Um, she was 93 and people were just dying all the time around to her friends. It was, you know, she would say such and such died today and two months later, such and such died today, you know, and, and, and she's just grieving everybody and which is what the very old do. And it, it's, it's, you know, she, I don't think she's plunged back into that same thing again and again. I think you just become these kind of, I don't even say that I'm not, this isn't sounding depressing, but it's it's not meant to be. But I, I think we just become um, used to it as a part of living, you know. Um, your wife uh, Susie says it takes great courage to be happy. I read she'd said that. It's true. Did she say it? that? Yeah, she's good. she's clever. <laughs> she also said, you time to be amused, by the way. <laughs> that point about, you know, it, it takes courage to be happy. And I, I think that's a really interesting thing to say. Yeah, well, <clears throat> it's, um, it's a defiant position. You know, it's a defiant position, happiness, very often. And it's, it's hard earned and it's not, um, it's a deep thing. Happiness is a deep thing because, because I don't think there is such a thing as simple happiness. I think you lift the lid and there's all sorts of stuff going on underneath a person's ability to have, be optimistic about the world. And, you know, so, so to me, happiness is a, is a, I agree with her. I agree with everything she says. Um, but uh, but I but it it is a form of defiance, I would say. And and you practice that defiance. I I, I would say too. You know, I'm basically a um, a happy person. You know. Take a little walk to the edge of town and go across the tracks Where the viaduct looms like a bird of doom as it shifts and cracks You're also having a, a, a moment and a, and a connection with new fans through uh, the theme for Peaky Blinders. You know, in a way, much that Kate Bush has uh, with Stranger Things. Yeah, I mean, that, that's not recent. That's been going for, for years. And that, that song, which is, to be perfectly honest, not my favourite song, I've got to say. There's a lot of songs that I prefer playing live, let's say, but that, the response to, the, to that song is sort of massive. So we, we, we continue to play it and I find different ways to do it. And, you know, but yeah, that's been following us around like a... You know, nasty old dog, <laughs> but doing, but you know, it it does. Um, it's it's good for us. They call me the wild rose, but my name was Eliza Day. What they call me, I do not know. For my name. Just before I finish, your, your person also with great friendships that last many years. And I was just thinking back to um, your work with Kylie Minogue, which was in the 90s. Yeah. I mean, would you do work again with Kylie? Would you? Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've worked with a lot of people. I've sung with Johnny Cash and, oh and you know, but, but I really think it was that record I did with Kylie Minogue, which I really hold in a very special place in my heart it, because we both took an enormous risk uh, to do that. She was instructed, I think, I believe, by the people around her, don't go near this guy. You just don't want to be associated with Nick Cave, especially back then. You know, I wasn't in showroom condition, shall we say. And 
Um, but, it, but it was also people saying, you're going to do a record with Kylie Minogue, you must be crazy. So there was, there was a... Jeopardy for both. Uh, yeah, there was a potential for um, disaster for both of us, but she just entered into that in, in a, you know, with just a whole lot of love and it was really a, an amazing uh, thing and, and it worked really well, you know, so we've remained, even though we don't see each other very often, we've, we love each other, I think, genuinely and, and um, you know, and it's always a joy to see her and if she wants to make another record, <laughs> then maybe there's a Where the Wild Roses Grow part two or something like that. Maybe she could write to you in the red hand files. Yes. Put yes, her application could. in. <laughs> Nick Cave, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.